Today on the podcast, I'm talking about the recent market volatility, and then I have a conversation with a fellow investor and fellow podcaster who invests where the puck is going so he can capitalize on the megatrends that are shaping our future. Welcome back to the Invest Smarter Podcast, the show that helps results-driven individuals make results-driven financial decisions so you can spend more time doing what you love and build and preserve your wealth. Now, I want to start the show off today talking a little bit about the market. Um, and really, it's kind of just to, to say, like, let's not panic about what's going on in the market. We've had some volatility here now over the past couple of weeks. Um, you know, we had the Evergrande story. The market was down over 2%. We had this week, the interest rates were going up and, you know, more sort of talk about inflation. And the market had another little pullback over 2% during the day. Yet the S and P 500 is still up 16 percent year to date. It's down less than four percent from recent highs at the time of this recording, which is Thursday, September 30th, 2021. So, of course, over the next couple of days today, uh, it could continue to go down. We'll see. But we are only down at this moment less than four percent from the highs. So, while we had two pretty volatile days, uh. We're really haven't really gone anywhere, and it feels so much worse, I think, because the market has been so steady for 18 straight months of just up, up, up. Every small crack was quickly backstopped by buying and dips being bought, a constant lull, you know, constantly being lulled back into that state of complacent bliss where we're all just so smart and making money in the market. We haven't had a more than 2% down day since May. Besides last week, the Evergrande story, Beside before that story, since May, the market has been within 5% of its high for over 220 days. And thanks to Michael Batnick for the heavy lifting on that research. And just looking at the chart now, uh, while it definitely felt like we were going to crack you know, that streak and go down more than 5%, uh, at the moment, we're only down about 3.8% on the S&P 500 from the high. So... And the market's up a little bit right now at the time of this recording. So, you know, it's I'm not trying to get into the minute details here on the market, but the reason why I'm even saying this is because I've now heard a couple uh, anecdotal stories of people who have actually sort of sold or made some decisions to sell uh, in, with this volatility. And there is reasons to sell uh, your investments, but this isn't it. This is not it. So... I do fear that the market has been so strong for so long that it has cultivated you know, an entire class of investors who think that this game is easy and that they are financial geniuses. Uh, when it actually gets painful, like maybe a 10, 15, 20% correction, I'm just wondering how will people feel then? My sort of investing career, to be honest, has spanned the entirety of a bull market to this point. I was in high school during the financial crisis in the late 2000s. So I was too busy doing stupid stuff to be paying close attention to all the pain that was going on around me in the financial world and in, you know, in households across America. So my battle scars in my investing career have come from trying to pick big stock winners with my youthful exuberance and overconfidence, trying to put too much on them and then losing my face that way. And those have been, in hindsight, great lessons to have learned early. But all my mistakes were made uh, in a backdrop of a strong and steady, if not raging, bull market. So my pain was felt by me and me alone. So my thinking is, what about the swaths of people like me that have never experienced a deep correction, except for the COVID crash? But let's be honest, that was over before it even started, in truth. Uh, All the people who have been saving into their 401ks over the last 12 years or so have been looking at their account balance every year, and it's going up year over year. And then they get a little older, they have some more discretionary income, and so they want to try their hand into individual stocks, maybe crypto. And to this point, they have largely been rewarded every time they've dabbled, and then they dabble some more, dabble more, to the point where now... Now they're at the point where any uh, by the book financial advisor would look at the asset allocation of some of these investors and say, you're downright crazy. Uh, this is uh, asking for trouble. All of this sort of confirmation bias is troubling to me. And when the market finally does something as it has in the past, it just so happens at this point to have been the very distant past where it's death by a thousand cuts. 
I will be curious to see how many of those diamond hands, as they say on the Twitter sphere, lose their shine. I think there's never been a better time for investors right now to gut check their investments. Uh, you could role play in your mind what would it actually feel like if some of the worst case scenarios would come about. You know, to me, so many people have done so well over the past 18 months and frankly over the past 11, 12 years. I think you'll do really well to preserve it. So when the market is ready for its next significant leg higher, because I don't know about you, but to the extent that I can feel what's going on in the market, I don't feel like the market's got an imminent huge leg up, right? Uh, it could, you know, that's the whole point. You want to be prepared for anything. So so when the next significant leg hires, wouldn't you want to be thinking about how exciting it will be to grow from there instead of maybe being in a position where you're feeling like you're just you're just crawling back to where you started? So if this recent volatility has in any way given you anxiety, fear, kept you up at night, anything like that, it could very well be time to stress test your portfolio and, and make a solid plan for the next 10 years. And I want to be clear by saying preserve, I do not mean sell. I do not mean make wholesale changes. I mean, just take an honest, deep look at what you've got. Are you overexposed in any one sector? Are you overexposed in any one asset class? What percentage of your assets is now maybe like crypto? Should things be realigned? Should things be set back to something that is much more realistic for you, for your goals? Is this something that is going to withstand a, mar a, a deeper market correction or a long, a longer winded bear market? Is it prepared to handle the weather or whatever it is? That's all I'm asking. To the extent that the next 10 years won't be as easy as the last 10 years, which could be on the table, then it would you owe it to yourself to make sure you're in good shape. And if the market does have another amazing 10 years, well, that's why I'm saying just make sure you're where you want to be because we want you to win if the market goes up and we want you to lose less if the market goes down. Now, let's get to introducing the guest for today because I have a feeling his diamond hands are not going to be in any jeopardy. This guy's a pure growth investor, primarily in individual stocks. And over the last 18 years, he's done well enough to be at the point now where he's going to be leaving his corporate job. And he's only, I think, 49. So that's great for him. His name is Luke Callard. And he started TelescopeInvesting.com as well as the Telescope Investing Podcast. Uh, where he and his partner break down companies that they're looking to invest in. Uh, he breaks down his philosophy on investing. And his philosophy is similar to mine, where we like to invest in megatrends. Look at where the puck is going. So so me and Luke obviously had a great time on this because it's two guys talking the same thing. And we go into his framework for identifying companies that are investing candidates. We go into what are some of the biggest megatrends that Luke is most excited about. We talk about how he finds investment ideas. We talk about what it takes to hold on when things get rough. We talk about how you can get started investing in individual growth stocks, who it's right for because it's not right for everyone, and why you should start small and be prepared for the volatility that can come when you invest this way. So it was a great wide-ranging discussion that I'm sure you're going to enjoy. And we even mentioned a few individual stock names in this episode. So this disclosure is even more important today. Investing in individual stocks is risky, is not suitable for everybody. All of the content within this podcast is for educational and informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decision making. All opinions expressed in the show are solely the opinions of me or my guests and do not reflect the opinions of DeWitt Capital Management. With that said, let's get going. Here's my conversation with Luke Hallard. Luke, welcome to the Invest Smarter Podcast. I'm really excited to have you because I think we talked back and forth a few times and kind of learned that in a lot of ways, I share the same philosophy as you uh, regarding you know, investing. I totally, I totally agree. I think we said in our last email, we seem to both be on the same page. I totally think we're on the same page. In fact, I was looking at your Twitter. I was looking at your model portfolio that you have on your website. Uh, listen to a little bit of one of your podcasts, and I even think that we like some of the same stocks. So, great. Uh, and so look forward to a chance to discuss a couple of those today, maybe. Yeah, perhaps. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go over some of the mega trends, I think, specifically some of the interesting reasons why you think they're so compelling. Maybe talk a little bit about some individual stocks. Um, we'll have to do some editing and post, maybe if compliance doesn't like it, but we'll, we'll see what we can do here. Um, and then, uh, yeah, but. 
first, why don't you just share how you've come to be in a place now where you're uh, primarily focusing on investing um, and not doing the whole uh, day-to-day corporate thing? Yeah, I mean, and I will say I, I'm still doing the day-to-day corporate thing. I'm in my, I'm in my final month, but uh, yeah, I'm working my notice at the moment. But it's, a, it's definitely an exciting inflection point in my life to become a full-time investor from this November. But, but yeah, let me tell you a little bit about myself and kind of how I got here. And it's been a long journey, actually. And, you know, the key to this is like get rich slow, I think. It yeah. takes time, right? That whole compound interest calculation the T in that, the time is the most important part of that, uh, of that calculation. Um, but I'm Luke. Uh, I'm, uh, I live in London with my wife, Katrina, and our cat, Sushi. I actually had to feed Sushi twice just now because I knew he was going to come by and kind of interrupt our recording today. Um, I describe myself as a growth and strategic investor, and I've been investing for 18 years now. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Telescope Investing, and that's a uh, website and weekly podcast dedicated to individual company investing. And I launched that in 2020 with one of my very close friends and co-investors, a guy called Albert. And Albert and I have been kind of investing together, sharing ideas, sharing stock research for a long time, like like most of those 18 years. And I think we realized in the last couple of years that the stuff that we were just kicking around between the two of us, actually, if we if we kind of shaped it up into a framework, it had value. And, um, and I think it would have been beneficial for others. And, you know, we started sharing that with close friends on WhatsApp. And I think in 2020, we realized, actually, we're having like 20 different WhatsApp conversations with friends. Let's just turn this into a website and try and get a bit more structure with it. I think having a framework around sort of what you've been doing is super cool, because it's something that I've tried to come up with my own framework. And I've always been kind of like I've had what I know I want to do, what I believe in, but it's, it is harder than it sounds to actually wrap it into a framework. And, I, and what you've sent me seems pretty neat and concise. So uh, why don't we just dive right into what your investment philosophy is and actually go through you know, what your framework is, because I think you distill down some of some core things really well. That, that's great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, really looking forward to talking about that. Let me tell you how I got to it, though, because I think there's a little interesting story there and how we how I feel like I kind of stumbled into growth investing a long time ago. So I guess I'd always been interested in stocks and investing. Um, and when I started out, I guess that was 2002, 2003, I really didn't have enough capital to invest in individual companies, although that was always my goal. So I started off with a bunch of index tracker ETFs, like mostly FTSE 100, things like that. Um, and it took me maybe two or three years, I guess 2006, and I finally had enough money in the market, in my tax efficient accounts, I felt I could kind of branch out and start to buy individual stocks. And I've got to be honest, I got really lucky. So I, uh, I took a bit of a punt. There was a company I ran into called Intuitive Surgical. You might have heard of them. They're a kind of telemedicine, robotic surgery innovator. And, um, and I, I found them in 2006 and actually probably did a pretty unwise thing of just dropping 20% of my portfolio into that one company. And within a year, it had tripled. And I thought, wow, this is pretty amazing, right? If this is what um, if this is what growth companies can do for you. But at the same time, recognizing there was a lot of luck in, you know, that one pick being, you know, quite a, quite a revenue generator for me. And, uh, and I, I really think that intuitive surgical exemplifies the telescope investing strategy that we've, that Albert and I have come up with in more recent years. I think we've characterized this as trying to make sense of the world, make forecasts about the needs and demands of society a year, 10 years from now, and then find the companies that we think are best positioned to serve those needs. And for me, Intuitive sat right in that, the center of that. They were doing something really interesting that was good for society. It felt kind of science fiction-y, and I could, you know, this just felt like the future of surgery to me. And Albert and I kind of characterize companies like this as having being part of a mega trend and we're tracking maybe 13 or 14 mega trends i could talk about when we chat today uh, it, where we think there are kind of you know secular demand right now for companies that are doing this kind of thing and that's where we focus our research we try and find good quality go- growth companies that align with our framework um but they have those what we call tailwinds behind them supporting them that sounds 
really great. Uh, I'm looking into uh, intuitive surgical right now. I mean, that thing's had a massive run since the two, early 2000s. So when did you say you got into that? Yeah, 2006. I think it's a, I think I'm like a 30x, something like that. Maybe 45x if I count in currency fluctuations. It's not my, I've got to be honest, it's not my biggest return. I'm sitting on like a 200 bagger with my Netflix position. That was, that was pretty fortunate. 50 bagger with Shopify. That's really been my growth engine in the last five or six years. Uh, I got a bunch of Tesla, you know, that's paid for the Tesla that sat on the driveway. I'm hoping that's going to buy me a roadster one day. I got a bunch of multi bagger returns. Um, a bit, I've been pretty lucky, but at the same time, I think that's, you know, luck, luck infused with judgment picking companies that just have this great leadership and this great mission. I kind of want to dig into that a little bit. So when you first bought into intuitive surgical, was it, was it something that you had done a lot of research on or was it something that like you just happened to buy it because someone told you to, and then you got lucky in that way, or did you put in some work? Because I mean, and you're talking to someone who's only recently, maybe a few years ago, started to dial down what I thought was concentration is is a winning actually a winning strategy for the right kind of person because i always think about who are the richest people in the world and how did they get their wealth well it was through being very concentrated and investing in their business um so and, and but we should acknowledge i guess that those lucky guys and girls they're on a bell curve and they're the ones we noticed that did really well and there's everybody else on that bell curve that perhaps didn't do so well so there's an element of the kind of lottery fallacy there so i, I kind of recognize that at the same time yeah, no, that's important. That's something I actually, yeah, I haven't thought about that in a little while. So that's good. But let's, so, uh, you know, if I cast my mind back to being a 30 something year old, I didn't do great quality due diligence. I actually found the company through uh, the Motley Fool. So I've been a subscriber of Stock Advisor and Rule Breakers. And I think it's one of their Rule Breaker recommendations way back then. And I felt that the Motley Fool were doing like the hard work, the heavy lifting for me. I didn't know much about investing back then. And I would just use my judgment to pick, the, frankly, the companies that I liked from their portfolio. But if we, if we, if I maybe turn the conversation to the framework that Alba and I have developed, because we've, you know, I think we've sort of, uh, we've leveraged a lot of really great sources like and the Motley Fool, Seven Investing, a number of other frameworks, but we've distilled out something that works for us. And I think there is a bit of a difference, a little bit of a difference in terms of how we apply our framework to some others. Um, and you'll have, I'm going to go through our kind of 10 factors in our framework. These will be really familiar to you, right? You'll have seen these all over the place. But um, just to rattle through them, like for us, number one is tailwinds. Has the company got market forces working in its favor? So, you know, great example, last year, the coronavirus pandemic, getting into companies like Zoom, like Fiverr, companies that were enabling remote working and work from everywhere, work from anywhere, you know, that was... That was, they were clearly going to have those kind of tailwinds supporting them. And, you know, that worked out pretty well. Um, and then after, after we kind of sub-select from tailwinds, we look at things like leadership. Ideally, as the company founder led, what does their culture look like? What are their employees saying about the company on websites like Glassdoor? I love doing that. I love working on Glassdoor. Yeah, it's really powerful. And you, if you really dig into the, the comments, now you've got to, you've got to filter out the disgruntled yeah. employees, but you really get an insight into kind of how the company's run and what the culture feels like. Mm -hmm. For sure. And, and, and no, another critical factor of leadership is have they got skin in the game? If, if, particularly if they're founder operators, you know, you, you would hope they would still have a significant equity stake. You want their incentives to be aligned with that of shareholders. Brand, I think is really important. And I feel like I've kind of shoehorned innovation into brand. I think we're going to re we're going to reset our uh, framework next year. So for me, actually, when I say brand, I'm thinking kind of innovation and a culture of innovation as being the really key thing. For example, you know, the classic example of Tesla, I'm wearing my SpaceX t-shirt right now, right? Elon Musk, that company do not have to spend a penny on advertising and marketing and just their culture of innovation they, they, they will outperform their competitors um, and they can attract talent. It's, it's a very powerful kind of flywheel that they have working in their favor. And then getting on to some of the other factors, total addressable market, like is this company a small player in a big, big field? Have they got a lot of market opportunity ahead of them? And if you're looking for growth investments, you know, you're looking for companies that can 5x, 10x, 100x over the long, over the long term. So ideally, you know, smaller companies where there's a lot of scope to grow. Moat, 
there's a, all different kinds of moat. I guess brand itself can be a moat, but they have IP and patents. Um, for example, like social networks, they've got really high switching costs for the end user. It's quite hard to take your Twitter followers with you if you try and port your, your sort of social profile over to Instagram. So, you know, that makes some, that makes companies like that very sticky. Um, and I suppose also social networks, thinking about those network effects can be a really powerful growth driver where every customer of the product makes the product itself more valuable. Companies like Fiverr, Amazon, you know, in the Amazon marketplace, every time you add a seller, you're adding more buyers, buyers are attracting more sellers, you get this virtuous circle. Optionality, has the company got the ability to kind of pivot their products into new markets? Um, like the Google moonshots, you know, spinning out adjacent ideas. But that's a slightly dangerous one as well, because if a company gets outside of its core competencies, they could, you know, they could be going down a bit of a dangerous path, perhaps burning capital unnecessarily. Unless they have good leadership that can recognize it early and dump it off. Yeah, precisely, precisely. Like you're totally right. All of these factors work together. And actually, you're, you're going to get me ahead of my final conclusion about how we're trying to make these things to work together. You've heard these factors. I won't drain them. But, um, you know, the last few things we look at, have, does the company have low costs of production and high margins? Have they got um, low customer concentration? Um, you know, what are their customers saying about them? It's quite hard to find something like a net promoter score, but that can be quite an interesting metric that you can use to ideally compare companies in the same industry. Um, what's the competitive landscape? How strong are their competition? Um, you know, you can often succeed just by finding a great industry and buying the category leader, but then also maybe a good strategy to have a basket of stocks in an area you think is going to grow. Um, and then really deliberately the last, the tenth part of our investing framework are financials. Like you have to pay for a good quality company. Um, but, um, you know, I, we look at financial metrics, but we don't do really deep financial modeling. I think personally, the other factors are more important. Like we'll look for things like rapid revenue growth, ideally reoccurring revenue. SaaS companies are really well positioned in that space. Might look at gross margins, improving cash flows and free cash flow. But actually, if the company's got great leadership and if they've just got the innovative culture and in the right place, the metrics may look ugly today, but you know they're going to look great in five or 10 years' time. That kind of brings me around to my conclusion. I see other frameworks like this, and they're quite mathematical, try and score companies, you know, plus one point here, minus one point there, try and come up with like a score to weigh things. I think that's difficult. And it, the answer is really probably more art than science. So the way Albert and I go about this is we look at these factors, we'll produce a kind of one pager, which we publish to our telescope investing website. And we try and call out the key green and red flags. And then we just stand back from it. And we say like, do we want to buy this company or not? Given given this context. So it becomes much more of a, you know, a subjective rather than a subjective investment decision. Yeah, that's really interesting that you sort of shy away from having sort of scores or metrics or making it too robotic because you're right, that can sort of, I found that hard to do when when a lot of, a lot of what looks very attractive in a company is intangible. It's not always something that you can see from a financial statement. I actually saw a study that financial statements are becoming more and more less important in terms of um, selecting uh, investments. But one thing that I've always struggled with when I've tried to make frameworks is without having a score or something, how do you choose from the vast ocean of, of uh, listed sort of stocks out there when there's so many to choose from? How do you narrow it down to ones you should even be looking at in the first place if you can't just sort of screen and give some sort of score maybe to narrow it down? Yeah, and no, I agree. And, you, you know, again, I'm, I'm going to say we cheat a little bit here too. So we, we found a number of great sources where we get our investment ideas from. To be honest, Twitter is fantastic, FinTwit. There's a number of accounts on Twitter that I follow religiously. I, you'll have heard of guys like Muji at Hypergrowth, maybe Richard Chu, um, Software Stack Investing. These, these guys are super smart analysts in their niche. And we lean on their research. Um, I, I would characterize, characterize my own investing style as being kind of jack of all trades, master of none. And actually, I th that works for me. I kind of, I, I like that, having that broad knowledge without super deep knowledge. And I think that can be, you know, clearly it's 
it's an individual choice, but that can be an advantage because then you're not suddenly focused in a, in a particular way. You know, you can be quite, can enable diversification. And if one industry just kind of isn't happening, or if maybe a tailwind isn't playing out the way I expected, it's quite easy for me to pivot and go look at a completely different sector. So for example, this year, I knew nothing about marketing at the start of this year. Now I feel like I've got a decent understanding of ad tech and some of the companies in that space. And actually one company in my portfolio, Magnite. I love that. That's, I love Magnite. There, if you've got stock in Magnite, you're in the hole same as me. It's been a real shame, but uh, that's one of my highest conviction picks right now. Uh, my, other, my other favorite one in ad tech is Digital Turbine. Which I don't know if you've heard of it. And do you mind if I ask, how, how do you find your investment ideas? Where did you find that one? Basically, I use the same sort of techniques you do, which is I follow people on Twitter, stock twits, uh, subscribe to uh, a few subscription services where I'm getting told you know, ideas and I'm doing sort of my own due diligence on top of it. But uh, when I first started in the business, I decided I thought I was going to be like this forensic financial analyst where I would just like get to know companies so, so well that I could it's almost impossible to do that. You can like these Wall Street analysts, in my opinion, they they can only follow so many stocks really deeply. And the ones that the ones that are like at Morgan Stanley that follow like twenty stocks in an industry, they don't even know them as well as you think. I don't think because it's so hard to be deeply, intimately knowledgeable with every facet of a company. You can only do so many. So leaning on other sources is really, really the greatest the greatest way. Yeah, and that, yeah, that's it, it, we live in a fantastic age, right? Where there's such a variety and breadth of information available to us, almost too much, almost too much information to make decisions. And that's very different to being an investor in the '80s and the '90s, I guess, where you know you had to pay for very extensive reports that probably didn't tell you anything very beneficial. Yeah, there's there's no doubt about that. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with you on that sort of leaning on other sources. It doesn't mean that you're Sometimes I'm like, oh man, I'm not doing like the work myself, but no, really I am. I'm using the sources available to me to find the, 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 uh, the investments out there that make a lot of sense. You shouldn't be too ashamed, David. You're, you're, um, you're, you're a podcaster. You're contributing to the FinTwit body of knowledge yourself. Yeah, that's so right. You're entitled to take something back from that too. Yeah. Well, as a, as a self-declared introvert, I can be sometimes a little bit too hard on myself and think a little bit too much about things. So no worries there. Um, yes. There's so many ways that I could take this conversation because I want to talk about so many different things. Um, I do want to talk about, just real quick, another stock. I think I saw on Twitter, you, you mentioned 3D Systems. Are you, are you involved in that one? Do you like that one? Because I love that stock. Do you? Wow. That's, that's such a, I'm so conflicted on that one. It, we, bought it, we bought it pretty early too. So my buddy Albert and I both, both went pretty hard on 3D printing stocks generally. I think we bought 3D Systems, Stratasys, and um, uh, X1 about maybe a, oh, eight, nine, ten years ago. And then we, uh, we, we, we gave up about two years ago. We're like, this is not happening. If you think about the Gartner hype curves, you know, that we'd fallen into the pit of the trough of disillusionment. So I think we exited. I, I certainly exited all three of those positions about a year ago. I think Albert's kept one of them. I gather they're now making a nice comeback. So I've missed out on that. They're making a tremendous comeback. Uh, the new management's excellent. That's really funny because so much of how we feel about when you're investing in individual stocks, in my mind, it's all about when did you get in? How long have you endured? How has that stock treated you over the course of the time that you've been in it? Because I'm the same way. Like there's been, there's been one stock that I was in for a while that I finally pulled the bag on because I was like, so emotionally involved, which I know is the wrong thing to be with this stock. I finally pulled the bag and, you know, you, then you can watch it go up and you'll always have that sort of negative feeling towards it, even though newer investors are all optimistic and maybe for great reason. But, you know, we, as, as we have this conversation, I guess we've fallen into the trap of talking about the stock and not talking about the company. And it's a really easy mistake to make. You know, you either get kind of fixated on the stock price and not looking at the company and its trajectory and its mission. And I think, I think Albert and I just had our kind of head in our hands when we decided that that the whole kind of vision of 3d printing wasn't going to happen and so we uh yeah we exited that but you know that's probably going to prove to be a mistake in the long term from from my understanding of that is 3d printing the the original sort of exciting vision was that everyone would have their own 3d printer in their house 
the whole thing got turned on its head and now it's going to be all it's going to be industrial manufacturing which is where it's actually meant mm. was meant to live right at Absolutely. least yeah and, and actually a really an interesting one of our mega trends that we look at so i've been badgering albert to keep this on our scorecard but this is like 10 years out it's like colonization of space extraterrestrial mining i think 3d printing is going to find its real home there when you can suddenly start you know harvesting raw materials from asteroids and passing stuff um and then constructing what you need in space rather than having to uplift it from earth like this is sci-fi stuff that's a long way away but applications like this are going to really bring together 3d printing ai so many different technologies and this is where we're going to see like many many multi-trillion dollar companies coming from i think yeah i totally agree space for sure space is fascinating to me i have a hard time putting any dollars to work there as of yet yeah uh there's one that i'm interested in which is called momentous which is they're coining themselves as the space infrastructure company so they're going to be uh they're not making a bet on commercial travel. They're making a bet on just helping um, with infrastructure and also like satellites as a service, helping send satellites up for people. So it's an interesting one. So we talked about some mega trends here already, just naturally. Um, are there any others that part- particularly excite you? Um, I guess I mentioned Magnite, and it's one I'm still learning about. But this whole ad tech industry is really interesting. And I think if we if we think about how we used to consume media, you know, linear TV. It feels like the world has already made the transition to um, connected TV, but the ad dollars don't seem to have followed it. And the large majority, 75, 80% of ad spend is still on. Like, the, you know, the broadcast channels where you can't pause it, rewind, watch it at your leisure. And it just seems so powerful to me that advertisers, the amount of insight they can get when they've done programmatic advertising, the benefit of their ad dollars, where they can target a particular category of individual rather than just, you know, like spraying their advert at where 99% of the people who see it will have no interest whatsoever. Just, you know, their ad dollars are going to be so much more effective on that platform. And I think we haven't, we haven't seen the revenues follow the sort the, the, the sort of capabilities so it could be a couple of years yet, but that's that's an area where I'm pretty bullish on and I'm trying to build a basket of stocks in right now. Yeah, the ad tech space to me is, uh, it is the one thing that I have a hard time squaring is that there is a lot of competition. Um, why I like Magnite is that they are, they have transformed themselves into the sort of, the big the big player in their, in their side. So they have the scale and they kind of are expanding their sort of stack of services to be, more of like an all-in-one shop from my understanding. It's a hard space to totally understand though. There's a lot of different, there's a lot of lingo, terminology. There's a lot of sort of dynamics that, you know, for me have been a little bit challenging to fully grasp. But as an investing lesson, sometimes you don't want to wait until you fully grasp something before you make a, make a move. There's nothing like having a bit of skin in the game just to get started and motivate you to do a bit of research. So I really like, yeah. if I see an industry or a company I like, I like just getting some money in just to motivate me to go and look a bit deeper and research a bit more widely. Yeah, that's actually, I totally agree with that. Buying just like 100 shares, just track it, keep an eye on it. And then yeah, yeah. It, then you sort of see the stock maybe make some interesting moves, the price. And then you're like, okay, I need to like see what's going on here. And then, you know, it might lead you somewhere interesting. So any other, any other mega trends? I mean, mega trends I can think of like medicine, precision medicine, genomics. Uh, there's so there's so many megatrends. Uh, marijuana is a megatrend. Two are kind of clubbed together. And I'm, I feel it's a bit tragic that there aren't great investments in this area available just yet. A lot of the best companies are still, <clears throat> still private, but cultured and plant-based meat. I've got an investment in Beyond Meat, but I'm actually considering exiting that fairly soon. We did a recent podcast episode on this actually just a week ago. Um, I think the best companies in, uh, in the sort of sustainable food sector are going to be the companies working on or developing cultured meat products, and they're mostly still private investments. Um, but you know, I love anything that's going to make us a more sustainable planet. And you know, I, th- I think this, you know, in itself, that whole kind of climate change is a mega trend. Related to that, uh, electric and autonomous vehicles. You know, there, there are a bunch of good investments here, and some pretty overhyped bad ones. But um, you know, the environmental benefits. 
as cities potentially post-COVID decentralize, um, you know, we start to see perhaps an increase in um, like cities spreading out, then uh, having having sustainable, cheap electric transport that's not killing the planet is going to be, you know, that's, that's going to be a, a significant demand for society in five or 10 years time. Um, aging population and kind of cost-effective care of the elderly. There aren't many investments in this area. I think Calico, my buddy Albert was telling me about a company called Roe quite recently, but, you know, we've, as, as that sort of baby boomer population hump starts to get into their, you know, their elderly years, we're going to, as society, we're going to have to find ways to look after those folk and kind of care for them and create social structures. So there's going to be significant demand there, I think. Um, I, I guess related to that, we talked about med tech and biotech. I, there's many companies in the sector I love, Intuitive Surgical, Teladoc. It's one of my big regret stocks for this year because it's not doing too well, but I think they've got a great mission and I love I love the idea of the product. And you mentioned some of the the sort of biotech companies in that same space, companies like Editas, Illumina, Garden Health, they're all doing very interesting things. A sector that we started to look at a bit more closely, but I definitely wouldn't say I'm an expert on, is augmented reality VR. You know, I think I think this this tech these technologies are going to have their day in the next five years or so. I've got an Oculus Rift sat next to me on the desk here. It's kind of a toy still, but yeah. um, you know, Zuckerberg's not that I'm a great fan of Facebook, but Zuckerberg's vision of the future is interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, we will start to see real applications of augmented reality in industry uh, quite soon, I think. Um, perhaps tied in with that, we're also looking at esports, game streaming. You know, that's that's kind of, uh, you know, one of an entertainment domain of the future. You know, there's there's real kind of growth and we're starting to see kind of sports leagues and things like that spring up around those those kind of e-sports rather than like physical sports. But as I not ticked off my list, uh, we talked about space, big fan of that. But I guess something that's probably a, a bit uh, nearer term in that whole area is kind of satellite internet. There's talk that SpaceX are going to spin out Starlink perhaps as a individual company. You know, as we... Um, uh, as we, uh, you know, as they start to build their network, that's going to be really quite interesting. Spreading um, gigabit internet to rural areas and to underserved parts of the planet, and that, you know, in itself, that could help bring online like the next couple of billion people, and that that could be a real accelerant for innovation in society. That I'm sure there are many Albert Einsteins out there who are just simply lacking the connection to. Um, you know, modern mathematics and uh, teaching techniques and just giving giving some of these populations access to things like YouTube could be, you know, quite a game changer for society. And then I guess we didn't even get on to um, cloud computing and internet of things, right? There's a ton of companies help, being helped by the pandemic because they're trying to create capabilities for other businesses to operate remotely. Uh, companies like CrowdStrike, Cloudflare, Twilio. I've got a couple of those in my own portfolio. I think they're going to do really well. Um, what did I miss? I guess e-payments and fintechs generally. I love Shopify. Um, and, you know, Amazon is a behemoth. It's the mainstay of my portfolio. But there are other great companies like Mercado Libre and C in Asia, and actually also now intruding into Mercado's territory in South America. Um you know, we, this is the future of shopping. It's happening already. And um, yeah, you know, I can only see this going in one direction. Yeah. Those are all themes that I'm also very much uh, interested in and following. And they all do have such bright futures, right? Like it's, it seems, it sometimes can seem so easy. Like, of course they're going to go up. And then one sort of thing happens after another. And next thing you know, there's market volatility after, you know, 18 months of going straight up. Uh, we've got, you know, like a day to day, like today, I saw uh, the main indexes were up, but a lot of the stocks that I like to follow are getting walloped. Um, the mar- the talking heads start to kind of get on on TV and start uh, kind of saying like, you know, there's all this inflation, there's margin debts at highs, uh, 
we're looking for like a big correction. So in the face of all of that kind of fear, how do you kind of manage like that? Besides ignore it, which is probably your yeah, answer. Yeah, yeah, you're right. No, I mean, you're, you're but right. but for but maybe but maybe not for you, but for someone who's wants to some for someone who wants to, you know, get involved in some of this, perhaps, you know, what should they be thinking? So so you're right, it is easy with 18 years of being an investor and having a few battle scars from various corrections to be able to take a bit of a unemotional view, stand back and say, like, don't worry about the stock price, focus on what the company is doing. Are they executing against their mission? But if you've got, you know, a significant portion of your wealth tied up in a company, and this is the first time you're experiencing this kind of volatility, I, I totally get it, right? It's difficult. It's quite scary. I guess there's a bunch of things you can do, some techniques that Albert and I have developed over the years that make things, um, you know, kind of try and help us keep a steadier hand, I guess, and help us avoid being emotional investors. Probably the first thing is um, have a plan, like have a, have a sort of plan for your portfolio so you don't just react to the news of the day and try and when you buy something, you know, commit to a long holding period don't sweat the short-term volatility um, and don't lose sleep over your investments, right? So if, you know, if you're really worrying that something's down, like many things in my portfolio are down 5% today, if, if, if I'm losing sleep over that, I'm probably overexposed to those companies. So I should manage my exposure, ensure I'm kind of diversified. Of course, days like today, I'm a primarily a growth investor, like <clears throat> with probably one exception, the entire portfolio is in the red. So it's easy to say, be diversified, but sometimes, you know, the whole market takes a, takes a hammering. Um, pr- probably the most important thing though is this saying, have you, I don't know if you've heard this quote, you can't buy conviction. So you got to, and I, I mentioned, you know, early in my investing career, I kind of cheated my way in, but now I do try and do my own due diligence. So if I have a bad day like today, rather than sweating the stock price, I'll go look at what the company's doing and I'll do some more DD and I'll try and build my conviction because there's nothing like having conviction in the company to help you resist the desire or the fear and to sell because, you know, actually doing, doing stronger DD on a company, you realize, well, actually this is today is offering me an even better price. Maybe I should be adding to this position, not exiting it. And then just probably two really practical things that any investor could do that I think would add value one is keep an investing diary. Just start to scribble down on a piece of paper or in a straight into a spreadsheet or a document. Just kind of what are you thinking, particularly before you make an investment decision? Maybe, you know, why am I buying this or why am I considering selling this? And record your, I suppose, your state of mind, but also mostly your rationale, because that's going to let you come back and be quite objective in the future and say, you know, why did I make that decision? A bit like my exiting the 3D printing stocks a couple of years ago. I wasn't really keeping a diary then, and I'd love to know what was in my mind at that point. And then the other thing that I think can be quite helpful, um, and, and it's something I'm going to lose as I, as I kind of exit the formal workplace and become a full-time investor next month, I think it's helpful to introduce a bit of an artificial barrier to trading. So currently, I have to get compliance sign-off to my, my trades, any buys or sells. And just takes a day or two to get the, you know to get through the process, and that can be quite helpful because it causes me to, you know, not just kind of trade like a madman. I have to think about things, and I have to, you know, kind of justify it because I've got to get my line manager to sign off on what I'm doing. So from November, I'm going to introduce exactly the same policy with my buddy Albert. I'm going to give him 24 hours notice before I buy or sell anything, and he's just going to acknowledge back and. If he thinks I'm doing it for the wrong reason, he might ask me why, and I'll have to be able to justify that buy or sell to him. And that artificial barrier to trading, I think, I think well, certainly it's prevented me from over-trading in the past. I think it's going to be helpful in the future. Yeah, that's some great advice uh, for investors. Uh, I definitely like the advice of if you're losing sleep, that's because you're overexposed. Uh, you, that's... There's no reason for your investments to be causing you to have undue anxiety or stress because it's not good for your health. It's not good for your relationships. It's not good for your life. Um, so I personally think that this sort of investing isn't really for everyone. Uh, you need to make sure that, I mean, why don't you tell me, like, what are some things that 
people should make sure, like what are some characteristics that you should have? Because it's one thing to be able to say, okay, I'm going to have a plan. I'm going to buy this on a whole refer a month. And then the first day it's down 5%. They say, what the heck am I doing? And they sell it. It's a bit like a Neo in the matrix. I think you've got to know yourself, right? Yeah. If, if you know yourself and you know you can, you're in charge of your emotions, then I think that's quite key to being a growth investor. Like, I'll, I'll be honest, right? We're, I've, I've got a website, Telescope Investing. We're trying to hey, promote... Hey, Kitty. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we've invaded my cat. Feeding him twice clearly wasn't enough. <laughs> um, um, uh, yeah, sorry, so we're... Um, yeah, we, I've got a website, Telescope Investing, and we're targeting uh, people who are interested in investing in individual companies. But I recognize that's actually only the right answer for maybe 1% or 2% of people who are investing in the stock market. The large majority of people should invest in passive index trackers and track the market. You're going to, over the long term, you're going to make, uh, well, market equalizing returns and the market goes up in the long term. Um, don't invest money you're going to need in the next five years, maybe not the next 10 or 20 years, right? Make sure your, make sure your investment is, um, is kind of sensible and proportionate to, um, to your wealth. And so you're not sweating it. Um, and then let just let time do its thing. Invest a small amount, dollar cost average, invest into it, passive index trackers and let time work its magic and compound interest work its magic for you. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, making sure, I mean, and also you said some people shouldn't uh, invest this way. I agree. Um you're someone who's probably an exception having, you know, maybe a lot of your wealth in this style. Like you said, you're doing this, like going to be doing this full time. You have 18 years of battle scars. You know how to handle the volatility. I'm sure you have plans in case the shit really hits the fan. You'll know how to emotionally deal with that. It won't be, uh, it won't be fun, but as people with battle scars, you've been there and we, we know that even when the shit really does hit the fan, the market always comes back, but a lot of people aren't going to be able to feel that way or hold enough conviction, or they'll just say, I need to get through this week without being so worried. So I'm going to just put it aside. And that can be a huge mistake in the long run. So with all that said, I think more people should think about, should consider having a pocket of their wealth in this kind of thing. You don't need to have 100% of it. That's, of course, that's not necessarily what most people should do. But if you had even 5% with some individual stocks, I found that for the average person, it actually helps them learn about the market and engage more with maybe their portfolio and sort of, uh, you know, just have more engagement, have more interest and learn sort of the, some of the emotional traits it takes to withstand it. Because if they have a, a sleeve of growth stocks, that get crushed on one day, but it's not affecting their overall so much. And they see it comes back. They'll say, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I see what it's all about. That's, that's really great advice. I, I totally support that. You know, perhaps, perhaps I have a cash buffer. So particularly for myself, if I'm, I'm now going to be living off of my portfolio, I'm going to keep, you know, a year or two years of spending money in cash just so I don't have to sweat times like this. But I think as you're saying, David, you know, have perhaps the majority of your investments, maybe in stable index trackers, but then have a subset of your investment pot that you start to experiment a little bit and maybe try out some individual companies and you know kind of test and learn, get a bit of skin in the game that way. Yeah, because it I mean it is fun. I mean, not for everybody. I'm sure some people just really don't care. They just want to hand it off to someone else or just let it go. But for some people it's it's fun. Like for me, if you have a little bit of a uh, you know, uh, an itching for just to like invest. And it's fun also to find things that you really like, you know, if you really yeah. like a certain company. And why don't you back them and invest in them? So, you know, I totally think that it's not either or, it can be both. And it makes a lot of sense for, it can make a lot of sense for a lot of people. Uh, and and you're, I, I agree. And you're saying something really powerful there as well, because, you know, the mega trends and the things I talked about happen to be my passions. And I guess I've been lucky that in the last 20 years, the things I'm passionate about, innovation and technology, have been sectors that have done great. But, um, you know, if you if you pick an investing domain that you know a lot about, like I know nothing about fashion, but I'm sure there are some great fashion companies and brands out there. Well, you know, at the same time as your you know your passion and your hobby, understanding that sector, at the same time you're kind of naturally doing due diligence. 
And because you're passionate about that thing, whatever that niche subject might be, you're probably the expert on that more so than a paid analyst in that sector who's just being told, okay, you know, you're working in this sector for this year. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I think conviction is the best defense against emotions. Uh, Like if you really understand something and you believe in it, then it's so much easier to just deal with volatility because you're like, wow, well, I know that, you know, I know this industry so well, I know this company so well, I'm just going to hold it because they've got a great future and whoever is deciding to sell today doesn't understand it like I do. So exactly right. So we cover a lot of ground here. I'm trying to think like what else I'm trying to think of for someone who wants to start investing in individual stocks. I know like, like you know, my business, we do that for some clients um, where it's appropriate. Uh, but do you have any advice for, for people that are looking to get started? Because I know my advice would be don't just half-ass it. If you're going to do it, go in with a commitment. Train yourself and get ready for what the journey it's going to be. Yeah. I, I guess we've, um, you know, we've hit on quite a few of the key pieces of how to get started. That, the most important thing is just get started, right? Even with potentially a small amount of money. Um, I, th- I, would, you know, I, I think we've, we sort of touched on it, you know. Make sure it's money you don't need in the short term. Try and be in charge of your emotions and use techniques like keeping an in di- a diary and having a plan to help you manage those emotions. Build a base of capital in passive index trackers, you know, low cost investments that give you immediately instant diversification. And then find your little narrow specialism or the thing that's a passion for you where you think you know, you know more than the market. And maybe just take one or two small investments. I would, I would say also, you know, how you build your portfolio is quite interesting. I guess we reflected on it earlier about kind of getting a small position and skin in the game. So personally, I try to uh, buy in thirds. So if I've, I've kind of calculated for my own portfolio, for me, a third is about a 2% position. And so, you know, I target having, again, this is quite a personal decision. I've got a relatively concentrated portfolio. I try and have about 80% of my invested capital in kind of a top 10, top 12 of stocks. So kind of if you, if you kind of factor that out, if I I would consider a full position for me to be about 6%. So then when I'm getting started, if I really know nothing about the company, I might buy like a little 1% position just to get going. But if I feel like I understand this company, you know, my first real position is 2% of my portfolio. And then I might just, that gives me enough skin in the game to maybe read the quarterly reports, do some research, try and find some people that are much smarter than me who are advising on this company and help me get a better understanding. And if after a few months I feel like I get it, I'll buy my second third and I'm up to kind of 4%. Or maybe the company's just naturally grown to that level organically. Fantastic if that's happened. And then the few companies that I really feel um, I'm committed to, I'll take up to 6%. And then you know, I've got I've got some positions like Shopify that have you know grown way beyond that, and so then you get into this other challenge of wanting to let your winners run, but at the same time you've got to exercise a bit of discipline, and you can't get too overexposed even in a concentrated portfolio. So for me, I try and manage Shopify at around twenty percent of my portfolio. If it gets above twenty percent, then I start to lose sleep at night, and that's a reminder, I should probably trim it. Yeah. That actually brings up a point about that I meant to talk about, which was selling and how do you know how to sell? Because I know for me, it's easy to buy and hold. And and I would say probably 70% of the times I've sold something, I've ended up regretting it or, or just not really regretting it, but just thinking, okay, well, I didn't need to sell that. It's done quite well. I don't really actually know why I did sell it. Maybe it's just, you know, for some random silly reason. So what are some reasons people should consider selling? Yeah, we did a podcast episode on exactly this subject uh, just this week, actually. And um, we, we, we kind of went through five or six personal reasons why you might want to sell a company and then some fundamental reasons why you might want to sell a company. I won't kind of drain our own podcast episode, but I might direct your listeners to our podcast at telescopeinvesting.com. But to pick, to pick out a few of those, you know, I think we've touched them already. So those personal reasons are things like perhaps you're overexposed. 
perhaps you've just got a better investment idea at the time. Maybe, um, uh, you know, maybe you no longer believe in the company. So there's a, there's a number of reasons. We go a little bit deeper on, on the podcast episode. But some examples of fundamental reasons might be just that the the thesis has changed. You know, the company is broken. It's not delivering. It's not, it's not sort of living out the mission that you expected. Maybe it's a Theranos and there's been, you know, crazy fraud, right? Good reason to sell completely. Um, or, or maybe just some of the financial metrics are worsening. You know, the company is just not playing out the way you hoped, or perhaps they're being overtaken by their competition or their product is becoming commoditized. So there's probably lots of reasons why you might reduce or exit a position fully. But I think it's quite good to have um, a rationale, not just sell because, oh, wow, the stock price is like three times higher than when I bought it, so I should sell it. You need to really study what's happening with the company, not with the stock. Yeah, maybe you could even like sort of occasionally rank sort of the stocks in your portfolio by a level of conviction or maybe have mm-hmm. like a, maybe have like a, like a, a list at the bottom that's kind of like on your chopping block potentially and sort of looking for more reasons to, but maybe just think through it, not be too quick to make the decision. Just make sure you fully think through it. That's, that's a great idea. And, and we do that. So I keep a kind of to-do list and that, um, you know, if I'm thinking about doing anything, buying or selling, often that that suggestion sits on my to-do list for a month or two while I mull it over before I pull the trigger. Yeah, that's really important. And it's easier said than done to uh, not just pull the trigger when, you know, just make sure you take take a step back. I think uh, we were almost at an hour here. I feel like that's gone, that went by pretty quick. Uh, why don't you, just to, to wrap this up, um, have any closing thoughts and be sure to plug yourself again because we want people to go <laughs> check out that, uh, that podcast. Yeah, so um, that, that, that's really kind of you to have me onto the show. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with another um, podcaster, particularly someone who seems to be very much on the same page as myself. So thank you for the opportunity, David. Um, so I guess you can find me, I'm Luke, you can find me at telescopeinvesting.com and I'm on Twitter at Luke Telescope. Um, always appreciate a chance for someone to go check out one of our podcast episodes and we'll certainly give your pod a plug on our next show too. I would be very appreciative of, of that. And, um, and with that, Thank you so much, Luke, for coming on. Um, I think we should do this again in the future. I think that was great. It's nice talking to someone who definitely is on the same page as you. And yeah, that was awesome. I look forward to sharing this with our listeners and have a great day. I really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in. As a reminder, all of the information on this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be relied on for investment decision making. Also, all opinions expressed in this show are solely those of myself or my guests and do not represent the opinions of DeWitt Capital Management. Please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and drop us a line at investsmarterpod at gmail.com. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.